Hello, everyone. It's me, Josh Brown. We're checking in with Nick Collis and Jessica Rabe as we do each month. Nick and Jessica are the co-founders of Data Trek Research and the authors of Data Trek's morning briefing newsletter, which goes out to 1,000 institutional and retail clients. Nick and Jessica also have their own YouTube channel, which you can find a link to in the description below. Hey, guys. Hello. Hello. How are you? How's everything? Very good. Yes? All right. Is it spring? I can't tell by the by the weather. It is so not spring in New York. <laughs> it's nothing spring like this. Uh, we're going to talk about we're going to talk about energy first and this was not planned necessarily, but we are recording this on Friday and obviously last night there was some uh, events in the Middle East and I I really feel like right now the question of what's the right weighting to energy stocks in a diversified portfolio is a hot button topic for investors. Um, even though the strikes that we're referring to were well telegraphed, this is just the kind of reminder that investors should be thinking about how much exposure they have to U.S. oil producers or or global energy stocks. What do you guys think broadly on on that topic? Yes, you're right. It is a big hot button topic. We've been talking a lot about it a lot with clients. And the most important thing to understand is that there's not a lot of energy waiting in most of the broad indices around the world. So for the S&P, it's like 4%. For the Russell, it's a little higher. It's like 8%. But outside the US, EFA, EM, it's 4 to 5.5%. There's not a lot of energy in these broad diversified indices because over time, you know, tech has taken over so much of these indices that energy has been kind of squashed down towards the bottom. Apple and Microsoft both have more weighting in the S&P than the entire energy sector. So there's not a lot of hedging uh, hedge in these indices anymore. And that's why it's important for, for investors to at the very, very least be equal weight, consciously equal weight energy in a portfolio. And in the current environment, we're telling people be two to three points overweight. You're still not even at 10%. So you're not super exposed to these names, but you do want this protection in case of an oil shock. There hasn't been one since 1990, but we could get one this year, and you don't want to be underexposed energy in that environment. You've talked about before your only real hedge in a portfolio against an oil price shock is energy stocks. There's really no other great way to do it. I suppose if someone is skilled, they could, for example, repeatedly roll a commodity futures contract, but that's not 99% of individual investors or mo even most institutions are not going to be doing that. So your next best thing is own energy stocks for that potential occurrence exactly. for other reasons yeah. too, but yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's exactly that. That is the entire picture. I mean, the last big energy shock was 1990, August 2nd, 1990. Iraq invades Kuwait, kind of out of the blue, and oil prices spike. And the S and P and stocks know we're going to have a recession because of that. Whenever oil prices spike double in a year, you get a recession. And if you look at how the energy stocks traded in the first week, the first month after that shock in August 1990, it was the only group that went up in the first five days after that shock. The S and P went down. These Names went up and they outperformed for roughly 35 trading days afterward as the markets were trying to figure out what's the next step, what's going to happen. Oil prices have doubled, we're going to have a recession. This is the only group that's going to make more money. So the stocks work really well over the near term. And it's an important component to kind of staying in the game. And it's even more so important now because we're only at a 5% weighting on the SP. Back in 1990, we were like 10, 15% weighting. So there's even a little bit more of a hedge for an index investor. There's much less of that now. So I wanted to uh, not push back, but uh, maybe ask a, a follow up. Yeah, it's pretty clear that as a as a percentage, the average household spend on energy is lower than what it used to be. Does that mean that we are less susceptible to a recession if there is an energy price spike than we had been in, for example, the seventies or the eighties or or even the nineties? Yeah, it's interesting. If you look at the CPI weightings on energy, gasoline in particular, it's not that different now from the 1970s, 1980s. It's roughly 3.5% okay. now. It was 6% back then. Obviously, energy prices had kind of inflated ahead of a lot of things. But it's still an important enough marginal contributor to a household budget that if all of a sudden you're going to the, to the gas pump and it's 5 bucks a gallon instead of three fifty, four fifty, you're going to end up spending less on other things. And so it is the most important marginal driver of consumption in 
in most U.S. households. It's a, it's a super important part of how people budget week to week. Okay. I wanted to throw this chart up. John, if you would. The good news is that the United States is now outproducing every other country on earth, according to the EIA. This is this is as of 2023. And I'll just read this. Crude oil production in the United States, including condensate, averaged 12.9 million barrels per day in 2023 breaking the previous U.S. and global record of 12.3 million barrels a day set in 2019. Actually, December for the month was 13.3 million, which is a monthly record high. Um, we are outproducing Saudi Arabia. We're outproducing Russia. What is the read-through to uh, – chart off, please. What is the read-through for investors uh, given that that's the new reality and maybe something that most people aren't even aware of? Yes, it is a, definitely a positive. Look, there's two components to an energy shock, an oil shock. The first is just price. You know, for example, 73 prices go from a buck a barrel to four bucks a barrel, massive price shock. And that creates a recession. But what's more important is access to energy, access to oil. The problem with 79 and the Iranian revolution was we actually had a physical shortage on top of high prices. I can recall here in New York State having to go odds and evens on license plates to fill up your gas tank at the, at yeah. the at, at, at the gas station. So if you had an odd number plate, you can only fill up on odd number days. That was a whole nother level of a problem. So you're right. The availability is not really the issue, but price can still create the recession. Okay. I want to move on to, uh, to the general stock market. Jessica, you asked the, the question, was the, was the end of March the top for stocks this year? And you have some really good historical data that looks at the likelihood of us having seen the top for the year. Yes, thank you. We've heard we've heard this a lot from clients, and the upshot is that if March was the top for uh, the S and P this year, that would be extremely unusual. Stocks don't just randomly peak across a given year. So, for example, during positive years for the S and P, it usually peaks in Q four because stocks have been rallying throughout the year. So. The S&P has actually peaked in Q4 70% of the time back to 1980, and they were up uh, 21 per, and it was up 21% on average on a total return basis. Now, during bad years, the S&P usually peaks in January. So the S&P has peaked in January 11% of the time since 1980, down an average of 19% during this year. But it's really. I want to. I want to pause right there. Yeah. So, so just to recap what you're saying, eighty two percent of the time, the stock market peaks for the year, either in January, or in Q four. That's right. That's pretty extraordinary. Yeah, it's very. It is. It is extraordinary. Um, it's super rare for the S and P to peak for the year during any given month between February and September. It's done so at most twice in September and just once or or no times uh, in the uh, in the other months. And when it does peak for the year from February through September, the S and P is only up or down small for the year. Okay. Um, but you do, you also mentioned that something really bad is usually the cause of a peak happening March through September. So can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. That's that's very true. So if March were the the peak for the S and P this year, it would require a powerful negative catalyst to develop from here. Okay. So, for example, there's only been three years where the S and P has fallen for the year and did not peak in January like it usually does. So these are July 1990, right before, as Nick just mentioned earlier, uh, Iraq invaded Kuwait, spiked oil right. prices, and we got, you know, it led to the Gulf War. Number two is March two, March 2000, bursting of the dot-com bubble. And then lastly, September 2018, when Chair Powell made a, a Fed policy mistake and um, overestimated the neutral rate of interest. So stocks, stocks may have, history says stocks may have peaked only if we get an economic surprise like Fed rate hikes uh, or uh, a Fed policy mistake, or we get a geopolitical shock that spikes oil prices and causes recession. So I wanted to mention that in the three occurrences that you list as times when the S&P topped outside of the normal window, uh, 
Um, in all three of those occurrences, the Fed had just recently tightened interest rates by a lot. And that's where the similarities are with today. So I, I brought a chart. This is via the World Economic Forum and Visual Capitalist. And what I would what I would add to the conversation is the 2022 hiking cycle was extremely fast, as we know. It was twice as fast as the 1988 to 1989 cycle, which preceded your 1990 example. And I know we're saying the proximate cause of the market topping was Iraq invading Kuwait, but I just point out it's this is also a factor that was common between now and then. Uh, also in 2000, also in September 2018. Do we need to seriously consider the fact that because this tightening is also part of the mix, it it's it's a higher likelihood that March could have been the top for the year? Uh, perhaps, but I think it's it's much more likely that history shows it's much more likely that stocks will peak in Q4 as opposed to March. It's happened seventy percent of the time uh, in Q4 as opposed to just two percent of the time in March. Um, right. And even though the S and P was up ten percent through the March peak, uh, the history says there's still plenty of room for the S and P to run because when it does peak in Q4, uh, it's it's up an average of 21%. It's usually up double digits. I think st going back to your point, I think, you know, stocks have absorbed the, the tightening cycle we just went through pretty, pretty well. Um, I think it really comes down now to having, like I said earlier, an economic surprise, probably Fed related or a geopolitical shock. Okay. We, uh, when, when you tell people that, are they so... I was very surprised seeing your data. When you tell people the statistical likelihood of there having been a top in March being that low, are they surprised? I think it just goes to show that momentum is so powerful. It's a really powerful factor. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Nick, I want to talk about uh, I want to talk about CPI and gasoline, and I know you have something for us on the gold rally as well, which ties into the inflation story. At least I think it does. Um, what What would you say? What would you say about the rally in gold? You you say it's not an inflation story, although a lot of people think that it is. Um, so t so tell us what you're looking at. Yes, yeah, the gold story has been conflated with the inflation story for the past six months or so because yep. gold's had this big rip and inflation's been higher. The reality is, gold is a much bigger macro story, and the story is this: when Russia invaded Ukraine, it became clear that the U.S. government wants to at least partially weaponize the dollar, and that's concerned a lot of different countries, particularly China, but other countries around the world. The sanctions. That, that yes, exactly. You when you, when you get sanctions involved. You begin to think, okay, my assets are not dollar good if I'm a foreign country that may have a problem with U.S. policy at some point. And what do you do? There's very few assets that are priced in dollars and that can be physically stored. And the biggest one is gold. Gold's priced in dollars everywhere in the world. You want to buy gold in India? You're buying dollars first, whether even if you know it or not. So gold is a dollar hedge. It's dollar exposure. But once you have it in your country, in your vaults, you do not have any worry about it being confiscated or and otherwise encumbered. So gold's become this secondary global non-US central bank reserve item. It always has been, but it's become a lot more. So pre-2020, central banks were roughly 10% of global gold demand. There's roughly 5,000 tons of gold mined every year. Central banks bought 10% of it. Oh, I think wow. numbers like 20%. What, last, last, normally they buy 10% of it? Before 2020, they bought 10%. They okay. bought roughly, call it 500, 500 tons of gold a year. Now that okay. number is running over 1,000 tons of gold a year on a supply base of 5,000. So you're basically double the amount of demand from global central banks. And even now, only about 5% of China's foreign reserves or reserve reserves are in gold. The rest are in treasuries. They don't want to own any more treasuries. They're comfortable owning gold because once it's in their country, it can't be you know, it, it can't be subject to sanctions and it's a liquid asset. So they have to defend the currency in a crisis. They can sell gold very easily. You can also sell it to anyone for any currency, which is what makes it a get out of jail free card. If the U.S. is freezing U.S. dollar reserves in banks that are held by a country, this is a this is this is why when you say it's liquid, it's not really as liquid as moving money through the banking system, which you could do instantly. 
but it's liquid right. in the sense that when you need to tap that wealth, you can because other people will buy gold from you. Exactly. And because you okay. physically hold it, you know, you don't have to worry about it being somewhere in a ledger, an electronic ledger, you physically have the assets. Okay. So you, so you don't see this rally then as really having much to do with CPI or PCE or inflation expectations. You really see this more as the rest of the world getting a wake up call that they need to have their wealth stored in something other than dollars. Yes. And it's, it's, look, it's not that liquid a market relative to treasuries or relative to other, you know, currencies. So it's right. a little bit chunky. Central banks have pulled back on buying over the past couple of months because the prices have spiked so much, but they have to come back. They have to keep buying. And I think the rally that we've seen is basically front running central bank, bank purchases over the rest of this year and into the next couple of years because geopolitical tensions are not going down. They're probably going to go up. And central banks understand they need a second item on their reserve sheet, and that is going to end up being gold. People conflate gold and inflation because of the 1970s, right? Yeah. The trouble with that comp is that we came off the dollar the gold standard in 71 with Nixon's decision. And so gold had not been available for purchase in the U.S. before then. It became available for purchase in 76 under Ford, but then had this huge run going into the inflationary top in 1980. And there's a little bit of correlation there as well as causation. So I'm always hesitant to say gold's an inflation hedge because our data set is not very long on this, but it is a central currency, a uh, central bank play right now. Okay. Uh, I want to also get into the CPI stuff. I think um, we were talking about oil before. Let's talk a little bit about gasoline. You have a chart here talking about the correlation between CPI and the gasoline component of CPI, which is not a large component. And I think this is important. Because when regular people are talking about inflation, one of the things they most they are most likely to cite from their own life is what they just paid at the pump. Yes, exactly. All the academic work on this topic says inflation expectations in the population are primarily set by food and gasoline, yep. things that are purchased very frequently. And the interesting dynamic is that even though, as you said, gas is only, call it 5% of CPI, it's got a correlation of 0.71 to 0.73, I think. And it's in that chart. Can you explain to, uh, can you explain what we're looking at here? Sure. The chart shows gasoline CPI and then um, the uh, CPI, the headline CPI number. And the two ch lines obviously track very closely when inflation on uh, goes up, it's usually correlated to gasoline prices going up. When gas prices come down, overall inflation comes down, even though 90%, 5% of the CPI is not gasoline. Right. And if you, we broke it down into two segments, you know, the early segment, 70 to 2000, the correlation is 0.74. And then the correlation since 2001 is 0.73. So it hasn't changed. Mm. That correlation is still extremely tight. This chart is why essentially the U.S. government is so focused on gasoline prices right now because it is the driver. If you, when one goes up, the other one goes up. If gas prices go up, overall inflation is not coming down. And inflation is still the hot button issue going to the election, still the hot button issue for the Fed. And so we can't see gas prices go up. That is the political reality of the situation. That's why Lael Brainerd was actually just out saying yesterday, if gas prices spike, we'll do more out of the SPR. It's a super important issue because that correlation is extremely tight. If you want to predict in CPI, look at gas prices because the R square is over 50%. Yeah. So one of one of the economists I was reading this week was saying just because WTI crude or gasoline are not a big part of the, inf the headline inflation statistics, or we screen them out when we look at core, don't worry about that. What you need to worry about is expectations because inflation expectations have the power to drive actual inflation. And this is the kind of thing that drives inflation expectations. So it, it almost seems like, I don't know if it, the right thing to say is it's a leading indicator because it's actually not just indicating, it's causing, uh, I think in, in, in some cases. What would you say to that? I think it's entirely fair. I mean, the, yeah. there's two elements here. There's the psychology of inflation, which is what you just outlined, entirely true. It is gas price and food price based. And then there's the underlying reality of if gasoline costs more, most every business uses gasoline in some form, particularly yeah. to deliver physical goods. If gas prices are going up, diesel prices are going up, overall prices will go up as well. And it's going to show, it's gonna show up everywhere. Right. It's going to show up everywhere. Yep. Okay. Uh, Gen, uh, Gen Z. So Jessica, I think you do a really good job speaking to some of our uh, 
and some of your younger fans and listeners and followers. So you asked the question, should millennials and Gen Z be worried about Mideast geopolitical tensions? The sarcastic Long Islander in me wants to say, you could worry all you want. They've they've been here before you were born, and they'll be here long after you're gone. Uh, but how would you answer that question? And I'm sure you got asked it uh, from from people in that cohort. Yeah, that's so true, Josh. Um, what what we do think is that it's super important to keep updated on Middle East tensions because geopolitics can have painful economic consequences for Americans. So I'm a millennial. My cohort has never really lived through a recession caused by an oil price shock. The last one was in 1990 when the oldest millennial was nine years old. Right. So of course we hope that tensions in the Middle East resolve quickly and that is our base case at Data Trek. Uh, but we still think it's prudent to prepare for an adverse outcome just because that will almost certainly spike oil prices and could even cause a recession. Okay. When young people worry about recessions, it's for different reasons than when older people worry about recessions. I think with older people, of course, they worry about job security. Um, but on top of it, they're also really worried about their portfolios and what will this mean for my my stocks and what will this mean for my retirement. Uh, younger people don't have that concern. And I would argue they are actually well served by recessions when we're thinking about their investing uh, situation. It's not great when it comes to their job situation, but from an investing standpoint, this is probably how they're going to build their wealth, accumulating assets while prices are lower. Uh, so could you speak to that dichotomy and how difficult it is for people to wrap their heads around? Sure. Yeah. I think I, think I have two thoughts on this topic that I think is important for uh, millennials and Gen Z to be aware of. Uh, number one, it's just is just that if we do get a recession caused by an oil price shock, it will not be like they experienced in 2020. They're not going to see stimulus checks. They're not going to see a strong labor market where they can negotiate higher pay and switch jobs. Higher prices will crimp Americans' budgets, dampen consumer spending, and companies will look to cut costs by laying off workers. So higher unemployment means higher chances of you losing your job and having a difficult time finding another one quickly. So I would my second point that I would say to that is for millennials and Gen Z, now is the time to make sure you have three to six months worth of living expenses in the bank account. So if you don't have that right now, get it as quickly as possible. And if your entire safety net is in your trading account, whether that be crypto or stocks, again, make sure you have that three to six months worth of living expenses in cash rather than invested. I think that's a great message. And then one of the things I wanted to add to that, uh, and Nick, I'd love to get your take, uh, having, having seen a lot of recessions, mental preparation is probably, after, after you've put away several months of salary as an emergency, after that, mental preparation is probably the best thing that you can do. If you don't have a huge portfolio yet, and you don't have very high cost of living yet, and knock on wood, you don't have dependents or liabilities that are written in stone, it's better to go through these things young than middle-aged, um, because not only do recessions end, as you mentioned, Jessica, they provide amazing opportunities to reinvent ourselves, to try new things, to take risks that we otherwise wouldn't, um, to learn how to adapt, and to discover hidden abilities that we didn't even know we had. And my own career, uh, I'm a pretty good example of that. I made a career change in 2010. Basically, it, it was forced on me. Uh, and I think a lot of people have stories like that. Um, so I'd love to hear what you guys just think about that silver lining when we talk about the potential for recession. Yeah, I think it's a great point. I don't mean to sound too dire. Um, like you just said, if we do get a recession, know that they always end. If you lose your job, you will get another one. And when it comes to your investment portfolio, if anything, uh, the pandemic taught us that bear markets do offer attractive entry points for stocks. And if your portfolio, if your portfolio uh, does get hit, you do have a long time horizon. Uh, and things like uh, things that you're invest index funds you're invested in, and things like the S and P and Nasdaq, 
do recover. I would just say uh, for this time around, uh, it could be a bit more volatile. Uh, should we should we get a bear market just because uh, from a geopolitical shock, just because a solution will tr- probably take longer than the recovery we saw in the pandemic crisis because we had such a fast fiscal and monetary policy response. I think that's a really, I think that's a really good point. No, they don't all look the same. Yeah. Nick, what do you think? Yes. Yeah, so I started my Wall Street analytical career in 1991, literally, okay. you know, 18 months after the oil shock we were discussing. And it was a very tough time to convince investors to buy anything. I covered the auto industry. The first deal I did was selling Chrysler stock at $5 a share in November of 1991. And wow. people just did not want to hear about it. We had to cart Lee Iacocca to New York and put him up at the Waldorf and rent out the entire ballroom and then show every single car the company was going to launch over the next five years just to give investors enough comfort to take a shot on Chrysler because it was absolutely bankrupt at the time. Yeah, And we end, that ended up being a fantastic deal. Stock went to 10, then to 20, and then Mercedes bought it in the late 90s for $48 a share. So it was a 10-bagger over the course of a decade, which tells you the kind of opportunities you get as an investor in a downturn. Um, but it's not easy at the time. It was excruciatingly hard to convince investors to buy a bankrupt car company that only sold in the U.S. and had a CEO that was charismatic but had basically endangered the entire firm over the course of the 80s by not saving any cash. So there are huge opportunities at the lows, but you have to be prepared to actually take the risk, do the work, find the names, and then buy and hold. Yeah. And even from the standpoint of starting businesses, um, famously, Uber started in uh, 2008 at the, the depths of the pandemic or 2009. You had this huge available pool of unemployed people who were happy to pick up a gig doing some driving here and there. And that turned into a hundred billion dollar plus business. Airbnb also started during that same recession. And I know you guys have done some research on this and we can definitely do this in a, in a subsequent show. I want to say thank you guys so much for joining us. And I want to make sure the viewers know how they can find out more about your thoughts on an ongoing basis. Guys, there is a link to Nick and Jessica's video channel for data track on YouTube which is in the description below and in the show notes. And of course, you can subscribe to Data Trek Research at datatrekresearch.com. Am I missing anything? We got, that is it. We got it all? All right. You guys, yeah. are the, you guys are the best. I look forward to these monthly check-ins with you. I know the audience does as well. Thank you so much. And we'll talk Thank soon. Thank you. Thank you.